Good day and welcome to our annual HMN business meeting. My name is Akuna and I'll pretty much anchor today's event. Today's meeting will be slightly different mm. from what we've had in the past. Mm. First, because it's virtual and also because it's more of a get to know ourselves kind of meeting. It's opportunity for self-reflection and self-rediscovery. Last year was a tough one for most of us and dampened our spirits somewhat, making us forget the purpose for which we joined the network in the first place. And that's why we chose today's theme, dynamic self-understanding, pursuing personal excellence. We, be we believe that to contribute meaningfully to any organization or group, there is need to truly understand why we are in the organization and how we can assist the organization to achieve its purpose. To our new and potential members, the Humanistic Management Network is a global interdisciplinary and interdependent network that acts, lives, and works through its local chapters, of which Nigeria is one, and also through collaborations around the globe. Our purpose is to encourage and support economic activities and business conduct that have unconditional respect for human dignity. Shortly after this, We'll have a presentation by Wayne Otterbreit, the counselor and CEO of Evans Academy. He will lead us through the process of self-rediscovery, after which we'll have a brief Q&A. Questions and comments can be made using the chat box. And then we'll, this will lead us to a formal address by our chapter lead, Kemi Okunyemi, who will give us the plans for the network has for the year, as well as possible next steps. Then we'll have an induction of new members and introduction of the various work groups. And this will be anchored by our very own Eniton. We'll then proceed to the breakout sessions. The breakout rooms will be according to our various work groups. The idea is to network and discuss our plans as a group for the year. So for the new members that don't have a work group, you get to choose the group you feel most more inclined towards. And for those of us that might have forgotten our work groups, we'll paste the various work groups and members so that for easy recall. And that will lead us to the end of today's program. So I encourage us all to stay to the end. Let's mute our mics and make this as engaging as possible when it calls for it. And let's remember that the success of the Nigerian chapter rests with us. To kickstart the meeting, our speaker has slight challenges joining right now. So we'll just go ahead to the formal address by our chapter lead, Kemi, and then hopefully he will join us. And, okay, our speaker is with us, so let me go ahead and introduce him. Okay. So our speaker, Wayne Ottenbreit, obtained his Bachelor of Arts and Bachelor of Education degrees through the University of Regina to work for his Master of Education was done through the University of Southern Queensland. Postgraduate training in marriage and family therapy was done through courses offered by the Family Therapy Training Program, Calgary. The Colorado School for Family Therapy and the Philadelphia Child and Family Therapy Training Center. A certificate in addiction studies was earned through Mount Royal College. Wayne has also been trained to use the prepare slash enrich relationship inventory. He's also a member of various professional bodies, amongst which are the Alliance for Therapeutic Choice and Scientific Integrity, the International Positive Psychology Association, the Canadian College of Professional Therapists and Counselors, and the American Association for Marriage and Family Therapy. In his professional practice, Wayne uses an eclectic approach, choosing what he believes will be of best benefit to clients. The main influences come from positive psychology, bibliotherapy, logotherapy, and Christian humanism. Please join me in welcoming Wayne. Wayne, you're welcome. <laughs> Thank you very much. I apologize for my late arrival. I got caught up with something else. I'm very sorry about that. I'm going to um, share my screen with you so that you're able to see some images that I believe are going to be supportive of what we're taking a look at today. And there we go. And hopefully this is all gonna come through very well. You are going to be able to um, see both yourselves, I believe, 
and the um, slideshow at the same time, I don't have the same ability. So I'm going to ask that if you are having some uh, questions, um, I would certainly like to be able to answer them while I'm speaking, but I might not be able to see that you've got questions. Um, so instead, if you could just save those for the end. Um, I was taking a look just, to, just for information's sake where we are, um, where you are, where I am. Um, and when I checked online, apparently we are separated by about 11,000 kilometers, which is quite significant to me. Um, I'm very excited. I'm very glad to be able to share this time with you. And I hope that I'm going to be able to give you something worthwhile. As I prepared this presentation, my mind repeatedly returned to the work of Stephen Covey and his Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. If you are already familiar with those ideas, we are going to um, see them come up again and again. If you haven't heard of them before, I think you will not only be introduced to some exceptional advice from Covey, but you're also, I believe, well um, recommended to take a look at that information. Our topic is pursuing personal excellence, and so it's important to define what excellence is. I suggest we think of it as being of a superior quality, but this is always a moving goal. We're never there fully. Although we need flexibility in life, we must also be able to envision and commit to this end, this goal, in order for it to be a realistic possibility. So we will need to spend some of our time today on that. But before that, we must first examine our own often unrecognized assumptions and perspectives. As Covey explains, everything we do is embedded in our worldview, the way we see and interpret the world. This includes those things that we consider of most value, and there are a lot of options, family, friends, learning, fame, wealth, or power. Whichever we choose, whether we do it by default or intentionally, affects how we make decisions. If we prioritize money, we will in big and small ways look for how to become richer. If we prioritize the family, we can end up acting in ways that we believe serve those we love, but which undermine other things. For instance, we might choose to lie to get a brother out of trouble. So I encourage you, and I'm gonna do this throughout the presentation, to take a moment, we don't have lots of time for us to pause for this a great deal, but to take a moment and think about these questions, maybe jot them down for you to take a think on them later on. Around what is your life currently centered? Kavi proposes that the best way to structure our life is to center it on principles, those stable qualities that give meaning and direction to the other aspects of life, including family, friends, learning, fame, wealth, and power. And I believe that the best way to think of these principles is as what the ancient Greek philosophers identified and what we've come to call the cardinal virtues, the foundational descriptors of good human living, prudence or wisdom, justice, fortitude or strength of will, and temperance or self-control. Along with what Christian tradition calls the theological virtues, and which other cultural and faith traditions call by other names, and those are the theological virtues of faith, hope, and charity, or love, every good quality we have is some aspect of these seven. So excellence then fundamentally includes seeking to grow in these traits. I'm gonna share this PowerPoint with your organizers afterwards as a PDF, so you don't need to worry about making extensive notes. But I do encourage you, if there are things that are hitting you right now, to jot those down, because later on, they might not come back to you. So what do you think about having a principle-centered life? And what changes would you need to make this happen? And even if you've already thought about having a principle-centered life, it's unlikely that you have done it fully. So what could you do to make it better? Covey's first habit is what he calls being proactive. This is to take intentional and creative responsibility for one's own life. It is to see yourself as the key agent for the decisions in your life. You are the primary author for what happens as you make choices in response to opportunities and challenges around you. You are never a victim. You are always able to make change. 
Some of you may be familiar with the English novelist of the mid 1800s and early 20th century, G.K. Chesterton. When faced with the question, what is wrong with the world, he replied, I am. By this, he did not mean to imply that he was the source of the tragedies and sufferings that have always been with us, but he was the only person for whom he had direct and ultimate responsibility. To focus on the changes that others should make is to distract us from what is before each of us. By doing our part, the only part we can do, we contribute to growth of virtue everywhere. Do you really believe that you are the main author of the story of your life? Being successful involves also understanding what is available to you in terms of your strengths and shortcomings knowing what is reasonably within your abilities and where you might need to find alternate means. While today's presentation does not allow for great depth on this topic, there's much to be gained through investigation of and reflection on, for instance, your family of origin, the multiple cultures of which we are each a part, and those natural dispositions we call temperaments. Though none of these can fully define us in practical terms, Without greater energy and will, we tend to repeat those patterns that we have walked so many times before. But remember, it is always within our capability to create something new, even if we need to start small. So what have you already learned about your strengths and your weaknesses, about your patterns of thinking and acting? What do you think you should understand better? And where can you get that information? Hubby's second habit is to begin with the end in mind. And for us, this means further examination of what excellence means in each individual life. Growth in virtue may be a universally shared aspiration, but it is not the only goal to which we aim. Not only does each person have multiple important roles in life, but each day of each life also contains smaller and larger achievements within that 24 hours. Excellence requires identifying and planning for these. So it helps to remember that not only is today the first day of the rest of our lives, and so we can begin whatever change we choose at any moment, it is also true that until tomorrow, today is the last day of our lives, and we need to take real responsibility for the finite nature of each moment. Some of this involves examining the requirements that your life has set for you. What does it mean to be an excellent mother or father, an excellent student, an excellent friend, an excellent professional? I believe that we are always in relationship with each one of these interactions. And these are chances for us to be able, sorry, to be even just a little bit better. So this image here, using the example of me being in Calgary and you being in Lagos, or at least most of you, I believe, being in Lagos, if I was to travel to Lagos, I need to know that is my destination. So I have to plan my use of my energy and my time. I need to think of the roadways that will get me to the coast. I think I would probably depart from New York, unless I was gonna fly. And then I would take a ship that would take roughly that path. So if I am going to a certain place, I need to make decisions that are going to get me to that place. And if you have identified, or if you are now in the process of identifying that you want excellence, then what does that excellence look like for you? And once you have that image in mind, then you start to do something to move towards it. So what are the different roles in your life? Are you a student? Are you a professional? What are the family roles that you have? You are a friend. Where do you want to grow in each of these? Because as I said at the beginning, we are always looking at a moving target. Excellence is never fixed. It is never just done. There is always more that we can do. And while you could choose to think of that as tiring, you can also think of that as exciting, that there's always room for us to grow always room for us to be better. How can you do that growth? 
Requirements are not the only place for us to search for excellence. There's also often within our hearts a passion that just needs some fanning to turn a spark into a flame. A motto in my professional work, and my professional work's work involves both um, counseling, so Vivens Counseling, and my online education work that is Vivens Academy, that we do online courses to help people with their growth. A motto that we've adopted is seeking life's fullness. I am very, very convinced that joy and potential are much, much more available to us than we realize and we usually settle for less. The joy and potential that are realized when we pursue excellence require reflection, intentionality, and energy. Few people want to make that effort, and maybe, I don't know the number, but fewer people recognize that there is an effort to make. They go through much of their life without reflecting on what could be different what could be better. I want to suggest that you being a part of the center, as well as you being present for this presentation, means that you are aware of, or at least partially aware of the idea that there is more available to you and you want to do something with that. What kind of ideas really excite and inspire you? And what are the talents that you can bring, especially to benefit the lives of others? When I'm working with clients, when I'm working with students, um, I sometimes will say that obviously the talents that you have um, are for most part talents that are shared by other people. There are lots, I mean, we're talking about almost 8 billion people on the planet. You are not the only person with any particular talent, but the combination the uniqueness of your life experience and all the different kinds of talents that you have gives you a different perspective, a different strength, a different way of approaching. And while there is certainly strength in unity and commonality, there's also strength in being able to see things differently and be able to be creative. Covey's third habit reminds us to set and hold to priorities. It says we need to put first things first. It is necessary to understand our worldview, the unique qualities that are a part of who we are as individuals, the way virtues are present in our lives, the responsibilities and opportunities we have, and the ways in which we can make goodness, truth, and beauty more present in the world. But if we do not get this all in order and use our limited energy and time intelligently, we will not be very effective, at least not as effective as we could be. All of Covey's habits work together. Being committed to prioritizing the use of our resources again requires intentionality. I apologize, I'm working at a school and so that's the bell that indicates change for classes. It means reflecting upon what could and is happening and being willing to make worthwhile changes if needed. If excellence is worth pursuing, and I sincerely believe it is, then we need to have in place those practices that support it. And those practices include how we use our time and our energy. So for yourself, if you honestly evaluate it, how well do you use your time, your energy? Could you reasonably use them better? There are some of us that are unreasonable in our expectations of ourselves. We push ourselves harder than we should. We create stress for ourselves when we don't need to do so, unhelpful stress. But there are many of us that do not push ourselves as well as we should. So are you reasonably using your time and your energy? What would be the consequences if you used your time and energy differently, better? As we close the presentation, I encourage you to make the kinds of commitments that I've talked about. Not only will it benefit you, but your relationships and wider society will be made better. Though I've talked of Stephen Covey's work today, another influence, major influence on my work, and it was mentioned um, in the introduction, is Viktor Frankl. 
and his logotherapeutic approach. Logotherapy is an approach, a, a therapeutic approach that is very much based on meaning. The idea that there is a purpose to our lives, to who we are as individuals. And Frankel says, and it was so important to me that I placed it on the screen for you to be able to read. Frankel says that the categorical imperative of logotherapy, so the most important focus of logotherapy is, so live as if you were living already for the second time, and as if you had acted the first time as wrongly as you are about to act now. Such a precept confronts one with life's finiteness as well as the finality of what he makes out of both his life and himself. Or to reword that, this is to imagine yourself in the future, looking back at yourself now, from that perspective, make the decisions now, take the actions now, speak the words now, that you're then going to want to have made, taken, and spoken. When you imagine yourself in the future, what do you think you will have wanted of yourself today? And I'm not going to, um, I think, do this now. I had thought that I might um, read the poem If by Rudyard Kipling in close, um, but I think probably it's more valuable for us to open at this point um, to questions, any comments or questions. Um, but I do encourage you to take a look at the poem, which begins, if you can keep your head when all about you are losing theirs and blaming it on you, et cetera, et cetera. And talks about one of the things that I think is most important when we are looking at um, the work that I am trying to encourage you to do is having an attitude that benefits you, that helps you to be the kind of person that is productive, that is truly seeking excellence. And maybe we do have, sorry, maybe we do have some time. I've just got a, a comment here. So maybe I will read this and share it with you. So if by Rudyard Kipling, if you can keep your head when all about you are losing theirs and blaming it on you, if you can trust yourself when all men doubt you, but make allowance for their doubting too, if you can wait and not be tired by waiting or being lied about don't deal in lies or being hated don't give way to hating and yet don't look too good nor talk too wise. If you can dream and not make dreams your master, if you can think and not make thoughts your aim, if you can meet with triumph and disaster and treat those two impostors just the same, if you can bear to hear the truth you've spoken twisted by knaves to make a trap for fools, or watch the things you gave your life to broken and stoop and build them up with worn out tools. If you can make one heap of all your winnings and risk it on one turn of pitch and toss and lose and start again at your beginnings and never breathe a word about your loss. If you can force your heart and nerve and sinew to serve your turn long after they are gone, and so hold on when there is nothing in you, except the will which says to them, hold on. If you can walk with crowds and keep your virtue, or walk with kings nor lose the common touch, if neither foes nor loving friends can hurt you, if all men count with you, but none too much, if you can fill the unforgiving minute with 60 seconds worth of distance run. Yours is the earth and everything that's in it. And which is more, you'll be a man, my son. And so with that, I open this up to organizers to structure as you wish, but I am certainly willing and able to answer questions that you may have uh, to comment further on, or if you want to share any comments. Thank you so much, Wayne, for your delivery. At least to give us a chance for a lot of reflection. Um, please, if we have questions, we can actually pen them down in the chat box or indicate. And um, but we have to do it very quickly, please, because we don't have too much time for that. If there are any questions, 
I know. So. Okay, Francis is asking if you can have the poem. <laughs> you could sure. send your poem to so, us. So yeah. No, so I will no. add the poem. So what I will do is I will send both this presentation, then I will also send the notes for my talk, and the poem is included in that as well. Okay. Okay. Thank you so much. Okay. It seems it was pretty clear to everyone. There are no questions that I can ask. I know I, I jotted some things down, the ones that really resonated with me. You can never, you are never a victim. You can always make a change. And that's really powerful. It's in our capability to create something new, no matter how small. So let's even commit to start to do something, no matter how little it is. And the sky I believe right. is the limit. So okay, it Toby like Ricketts, you can go ahead. You have a question. Please unmute yourself and ask. Hello. Good afternoon. Hello. Good afternoon. Hello. Good afternoon. Yeah. Thank good you. Good morning good for afternoon. me. Good afternoon. <laughs> okay. Good morning. Uh, I was trying to type the question, but thank you for um, the insightful delivery and your presentation, Wayne. So, um, my question is this: How do I know I am on the path or have attained excellence? You know, you mentioned that in your excellence we need to kind of define what excellence means to us. So what are the pointers? What are the measures? How do I know I am on the path or I've attained excellence even after defining what this excellence is? So just for, you know, for us to, um, to have some common knowledge about that as well. Thank you. Excellent. So, um, so for one answer to that, I would, um, there's two parts to it. The, the first part is to say that as humans, we are not scientifically precise. And so we need to, we're always in process. We're always doing what we can. Hopefully we're doing the best. We're hopefully doing good. So I would encourage people not to be too um, precision oriented. The other thing that I would suggest, and I have to, in order to answer that, I have to go back to the fact I'm a Christian. And so I have to go back a little bit to share something from my background that can be applied to other backgrounds if necessary. Um, we recognize um, there's a passage in the Bible in, in the book of Galatians that talks about the fruits of the Holy Spirit. And when I think of, because this has been on my mind for another uh, presentation I'm preparing, uh, when I think about what it looks like to be successful, I think of that passage. And I wish I had a picture of my grandmother here. Uh, I have it in my other office, but not here. She, to me, is a person that represents that. Um, that passage talks about um, these fruits being things like gentleness and patience and joy. And I don't remember all of them right now, but going on with those, that I think is a sign of a person who is on the path towards excellence, as I would, rec as I would um, kind of measure it. That is to say, a person who is placing, first of all, those virtues, those principles at the center of life. If you are instead saying, well, the center of my life is about wealth, well, then your measure of excellence is going to be the accumulation of wealth. Um, if it's about friendship, it might be the number of friends that you have. It might be what you perceive to be the quality of friends. But as I said, I think the first step is going along with Cubby is the prioritizing of principles. And then after that, those other things that are also important, just not of first importance. And so, um, as I say, I think much of what life is about is our relationship to other people. And so my measures of success are, for instance, that I am a husband, I am a father before my profession, then professionally, am I serving people well? Do I find a, an appropriate satisfaction in what I do? And I would suggest finally, is that this is also worthwhile for you to do as a check with other people, people who are important in your life. So for me, with my wife, so as I look at things and I think, oh, I think this is going well, or I don't think this is going well, for me to check in with my wife and for me to hear what she has to say as well, because she has also got another perspective, a different wisdom that can help me to kind of um, fine tune. I hope that's helpful for you. Yes, please go ahead. Thank you, Amomi, please go ahead. Okay. Thank you very much for the um, presentation. Was really insightful. Many things I find really helpful. 
And um, I actually have two things. First is the request for the, the quotation of, the, of Victor Frankl. The, the, the last slide had something that Victor Frankl said. Yes. And I mean, I'd really like to have know where, where it came from. And the, the question that I have is also related to that, um, that quote. Um, I mean, I was thinking about the, 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 the message and the impact of having to think all the time that you've acted wrongfully previously. Um, I'm just wondering if that couldn't lead to some, lead some, some form of anguish. You know, sometimes like I'm never going to, I mean, be sure that I'm acting well. How does one have some form of equilibrium and balance that be, between the, the motivation to try and do better and the anguish of feeling that I, I haven't done well or I haven't acted rightly ever? I mean, I'm, I'm just looking at that perspective. I, I was wondering if there's any advice to what Did you back. have two statements you wanted to make or? Now, the first one was a request for the quotation. Okay. okay. Uh, so, the, the references for him. And the second one is, is this, this observation. Okay. And, the and I think that's also a very, that's a very good request. That's a very good insight for you to have. Um, it has something to do um, with the type of person that we are. So in my professional work, kind of unfortunately, one of the things that I deal with a lot is people who are expressing um, or dealing with experiencing elevated levels of anxiety. Um, and so there are personality types that tend to get anxious more easily than other people do. One of the things that I like about counseling is that I am working with usually one person. And so I'm speaking directly to that person and I'm responding to what that person's experience is. So I know, for instance, this is a person who um, is more anxious or less anxious. If you are insufficiently anxious, then you actually should be more anxious, right? We have to have a good balance. But for people who would look at that quote and say, oh, I'm never good enough or whatever, what I would be trying to do is say, no, no, no. There is great goodness in who you are already and what you have done. If you are putting an effort through, again, from my background, um, a statement that makes um, a great deal of sense to me, that's very consoling to me, is we are just supposed to be faithful. We're just supposed to do what we can, right? Now, if while you are doing what you can, you are also being more helpful and giving more value to other people, I think there's also a great goodness in that. But just the very fact that you are you is a goodness. Can you be a better you? Yes, you can. But you want to be balanced about that. So we don't want to break ourselves in our seeking for growth. We just want to grow. In the same way, kind of as a, as a plant, right? You don't you don't make a plant grow faster. That doesn't make any sense. You nurture it, you support it. And so I think maybe the best answer to this is to say that it is an attitude. And I have to tell you, before I became a counselor, I don't think I had a very good attitude. I was kind of hard on myself. I, um, I did not relate as well as I think I should have. But in being a counselor, I've learned things that hopefully are benefit to others but have also been of benefit to me. And so I've applied that to my own life. And then that is something that I try to do with other people as well. So I think it's an excellent question, but the very best answer to your question is that it takes a time of processing and developing an attitude that knows how to balance seeking better, but also being okay with who you are at this time. Thank you very much. You're welcome. There are two questions in the chat. Um, one is, what is what's the suggested means of picking up projects that one was unable to complete at a point? And also, uh, so, okay. Yeah. Okay, so and can also, I respond? Okay, respond to that. I'll do, yeah, so um, again, I love quotations. You might hear me say quotations a lot. One quotation that I've heard was, um, you did the best you knew how to do then. Now, if you know how to do better, do better now, right? So it's, it's this balance of, again, not judging yourself unduly. I, I would also suggest for those of you that are parents, or if you are able to imagine what it is to be a parent, it is to treat yourself in the way that you would treat a child that you love, right? We don't merely accept, we don't say it's okay for you just to stay where you are, that's not good enough for the child 
but we also don't say get better, get better, get better, right? We, we help the child to learn. We help ourselves to learn. So we practice patience and gentleness with ourselves. And if you look back and you realize I should have done better, then if you're capable of doing that now, you do that. If you need to apologize, if you think that's worthwhile, you apologize. But again, being gentle, being able to be good to ourselves. I have a friend who, when he finds things difficult with other people, he sometimes says, he just imagines we're all children. And to me, that's so true. We all, like, sometimes we take ourselves too seriously. Let's do a good job, but we're all in this together. I think life is wonderful, but it's messy. And so we just got to be patient. And the second question. I think this might have been answered somewhat, but how do we achieve excellence when a person has various positions and various responsibilities that influence one's life? Yeah. Um, so let me confess that I have a lot of stress right now because I have a lot of things happening for me in a lot of different areas that don't overlap. So it's not like I can say to my boss, um, I'll do number two after I do number one. Number one is for this boss. Number two is for this other boss. Number three is for another boss. And so because they aren't all united, I have to manage all of that. Um, and so it really comes down to balance. It really comes down to um, sitting on my desk or pieces of paper. That's how I try to organize myself. Um, and so for me, um, I've learned for myself that if I can see big picture, then I know, okay, I need to give some energy over there and some energy over there and some energy over there. Um, I am older probably than most anybody on this. So it's taken me 50 years to learn some of these things. Um, you only have a certain amount of energy in a day and you cannot spend more than you have. So you just do the best that you can. And if at the end of that, you realize that you would like to have done something different, it would have been better, then you start the next day with that. Again, you be gentle and forgiving with yourself, but you also do have to do some prioritizing. And I think of that as an opportunity. Your excellence is your management. I think. Um, I think the greatest freedom that I have um, that I appreciate professionally is that I get to be in charge of myself and I get to determine where my time and my energy goes because that allows me to seek excellence instead of waiting for somebody else to tell me, do this next, do this next. That person doesn't know me as well as I know me. And so it involves taking responsibility for yourself. Thank you so much. I think that will be all for the Q&A. I want to say a very big thank you to you, Wayne, for making our time for us. I know you're incredibly busy for sitting with us and giving us this chance to actually do a lot of self-introspection. It's been wonderful. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Let me apologize again for my misstep at the beginning. Um, I allowed myself to be distracted by something else. Um, certainly don't want you to view that as any disrespect to you. I very much appreciated this opportunity. I will send those notes off to you. Um, I hope they're of value to you. I will share with the organizers, actually the organizers already do have my contact information, which they are free to share with anyone who asks. Um, if you ever have any questions, feel free to be in contact with me. Thank you, Wayne. Thank you very much. Have a wonderful rest of your meeting. Thank you. Thank you.